The story is told at the turn of the 20th century of a husband and wife. It's a true story. The girl, she's now on the way to sainthood. Her name was Elizabeth. She belonged to a Catholic family, rich in the faith. A marriage was arranged to another boy who was a doctor, a famous doctor, also belonging to a Catholic family, and his name was Felix, a famous doctor in Paris. Just a few months before the marriage could take place, to her shock, Elizabeth realized that her husband did not believe in God. The family, though Catholic, the husband himself did not believe in God. Instead, he believed that there was no God, he was an atheist. To her shock, she realized that the man she was to marry also publishes a magazine, an atheist magazine, which declares there is no God and he is the editor of it. Anyway, Elizabeth went ahead with the marriage. And after the marriage, they saw two trends in their house. One trend was that of godlessness. In fact, there was a whole library in her house of all godless books, atheist books. And Elizabeth herself, in the same house, a woman of faith who believed. One day, her husband, taking advantage of the fact that she was tired and sick, gave her a book from his atheist library to read, in the silent hope that it would change his wife to become an atheist. She read the book, but far from losing her faith, that book made her search for her faith. And so she started reading a lot of literature on the Catholic faith. The result was, in that family, you had two libraries coming up. One was the atheist library, which always there was from the beginning. And the second was a library of all books on faith. Elizabeth, in course of time, fell sick. It is said that she had some kind of cancer. And around the year 2000, in, around the year 1914, she was dying. And as she lay dying, she said to her husband, Felix, after I die, you will embrace the faith and you will in fact become a priest. And Felix, holding her in his arms, said, Elizabeth, my darling, I love you a lot, but I have sworn enmity to God. I have never believed in him. I will never believe. And so Elizabeth died. And after she died and her funeral was over, her husband was clearing her things when he came across a diary, a personal diary. He opened and read it. And he found an entry several years before she fell sick. She had written like this. She said, I have asked my God to change the faith of my husband. I have agreed with my God that I am ready to pay any price for the soul of my husband. On the day I will die, the price will have been paid. And she wrote, greater love than this, no woman can have than to give her life for her husband. Felix read this and he laughed at it. And he closed the Bible and threw it away, thinking about the simplistic faith of his wife. He decided to make a trip to Lourdes, Lourdes, that place in France where the Blessed Virgin Mary had appeared. The purpose of making this trip was to write a critical book on Lourdes. So he went to Lourdes to write this critic. And as he was standing there, at the very place where the Virgin Mary had appeared, which is now a place where millions flock, and you know the Virgin Mary appeared at the very place where earlier pigs, there were a lot of pigs which used to come there. So symbolic. God comes to man who is not even worthy. And the Virgin appeared there, and as he was standing there, 
in his mind with all his critical ideas, suddenly the gift of faith was given to him in one flash. In just one second he realized the futility of his thoughts, the uselessness of all the things that he was thinking. In one second it was conveyed to him. Felix, the great doctor, went to Lourdes to write a book against the faith. He came back with his faith. And he started practicing his faith. Later, when he went to meet the reigning Pope, he told the Pope the story of his conversion and what role his wife had played in it. And he asked the Holy Father whether he could become a Dominican priest as his wife had predicted it. And the Holy Father refused the permission, saying that you need to be a lay person and teach others who are godless. Bring them back to the right path. However, for reasons unknown, 20 minutes later, down the conversation, the then Holy Father turned to Dr. Felix and said, I reverse my earlier decision. I give you permission to become a Dominican priest. And so, Dr. Felix Lessier, the famous atheist who never believed in God, by the prayers and sufferings of his wife and the faith of his wife, became Father Felix Lessier and he died as a priest. A fantastic real story. And today, Elizabeth Lessier, his wife, has the title of Servant of God, Elizabeth Lessier, and is considered the patron of all those childless couples. Dear friends, godlessness is like that. It requires a simple act of God for faith to come. And when faith does come, it is a grace of God. It makes us realize the futility of our thinking. As St. Paul would say to the Corinthians, he says, their minds have been trapped by the dark God of this world. The darkness of the God of this world has trapped their mind. That's why they cannot see the light of Christ. Dear friends, the first step is taken when we start truly believing in God. Till then, we are like the donkey holding back. We are like the ones who have the attitude, never will it happen. But then, once you start believing in God, presents the second step. You can come to God, you can believe in Him. But often, like horses, we go much ahead of Him. And so we steep and we bury ourselves in rituals. We bury ourselves in practices. We bury ourselves in religious activity, doing all this, but failing to realize the heart of God. What God wants, and so rightly said by the psalmist, He says, don't be like a horse which goes ahead. Don't be like a donkey which refuses to come. But be like one who will walk with me hand in hand. What God wants, and what we realize in time, is a relationship with us. He always wanted this relationship. This is pure nonsense to a person who does not know God. He says, where is God? Who is this person who wants a relationship? But indeed, when you come to God and start walking with Him, you realize God is no longer God. He is a person, the person of Christ. And a meaningful relation starts developing. And the words of Jesus Take flesh, I will be with you till the end of age. But before this happens, we must get out of a religion where we only memorize all the events, all the activities, and our heart is somewhere far off. As the prophet Isaiah says, these people, these people claim to worship me, but their hearts are far away. They have simply memorized all religious activity. Their religion is only memorizing various things. Their heart is far away from me. So therefore it is possible for us to mechanically be in a, rel a religion, to say that we believe, but yet not find the heart of God. St. Paul was such until he found the Lord Jesus. We know he was Saul, and we know he was a Pharisee. And mind you, as a Pharisee, they were very strict about religious rules. Pharisees would fast twice a week, which is better than us. They would pray from morning. They would know all the scriptures, often writing the scriptures even on their clothes. 
Saint Paul was an expert in this. Such an expert that in his zeal he tried to persecute the followers of Christ. And you know what happened. Later, when thrown down, his conversion took place. Please note, the conversion of Saul into Paul was accompanied by a blindness. He was blinded to everything of this world. This is what happens in a true encounter with God. Suddenly, all the things of this world become, we become blind to it. All the things that were attractive earlier, no longer attractive. And Paul, now Paul, was blinded to all these things. Paul's conversion did not take place as a, as a result of logic or argument. It was an act of God, an act of grace, which suddenly blinded him to all things. And when his eyes finally open, they open only to God. That is the beginning of a true God experience. When you seek only God. That's what the Bible says. It says, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you search me with all your heart, you will definitely find me. Then you will call to me and I will answer you. Then you will pray to me and I will hear you. But you seek me with all your heart. In other words, when we seek him with half a heart, a divided heart, we never find him. The prophet Isaiah is more specific. Isaiah says, the Lord will take you through hard times until you seek him with all your heart. Of course you will hear the voice of the Lord guiding you. Don't go to the left, don't go to the right. You will hear his voice. Which means in the process of seeking God with all your heart, God will teach you to recognize his voice. He'll take you through hard times until the day you take all those things dear to you. All those idols, silver-plated and gold-plated. Please note the description. You will take your idols which are plated with silver and plated with gold, which means they're not really gold, not really silver, only plated. And truly, the things that we value in this world and we work for so much and chase after, we think they're the gold and silver of our life, we should chase them. Really, they're only plated on the outside. And Isaiah in chapter 30 says, one day will come, you will take these gold-plated and silver-plated idols and throw them out and say, out of my sight, I only want God. And that day, Isaiah said, you will be healed. That day, the healing hand of the Lord will come. The same Lord who had allowed wounds in your life, the same Lord will heal you on that day. The day you seek God. Jesus said it in most simple language. He simply said like this in Matthew chapter 6 and 33. He said, seek first the kingdom and what God wants of you. The rest will be added unto you. The rest will be added unto you indeed is God's part. The first part, seek first the kingdom and what God wants depends on you and me. That's why the Lord said, if you see Luke chapter 16, he says, I know you people, whatever you do is only to impress others and to show that you're very godly people, but your hearts are far away from me. True religion is this, not doing things outwardly, not doing things out of mechanical rote, seeking the heart of God. I want you and only you. As, this, as David would say, you alone are my heart's desire and I long for you, Lord. Hence you will see in the search for God, these two obstacles, one of godlessness, almost that of the donkey, never attitude, the second attitude of going far ahead like the horse. And Acts of the Apostle says, actually, God is not far from us. He's there. Acts of the Apostle chapter 17 says, the reason you were created was to search for God. Do we do that? Throughout our life, we are searching for ourselves. We are searching for our identity, to build up our identity, to build up our family, to build up material things. Are we searching for Him? And Acts of the Apostle says it so well. God created them so that they may look for Him. The prophet Hosea goes on to say, he says that, the Lord says, I will abandon my people until they come looking and searching for me. I will abandon my people. These are things that I would not understand. In the years and in the regime of godlessness that I lived, I would not understand it. I would laugh at it. Should you have told me this during that time, I would have ridiculed you. I would have mocked you. And I would have mocked the Bible. Such is the attitude of the sinner. 
Such is the attitude of those who know only what he wants to do. But once you come to God, the first thing he points out is his word, the Bible. And as you come to know him through the Bible, that is the time you come closer to his heart. That brings us to the third obstacle in having a God experience. Many people are content with only doing outward things, but they refuse to come to the Word. Romans chapter 10 says, Faith comes by hearing the Word of Christ. We need to go to the Bible. In the absence of the Bible, we will become people of discouragement. And by going to the Bible, I do not mean that God wants us to become scholars who know the Bible from end to end, can quote it and can, like a parrot, know. If it was so, all those working and studying in the seminaries, etc., would all have been angels, but it is not so. What he means is, through the pages of the Bible, search for me, so that you come to know how I work in your life. This is what Jesus meant when he said in John 5, he said, you study the scriptures to search about me, yet you are not willing to come to me. Which means that a study of the Bible must result in me coming to Jesus in total surrender. Lord, I trust you. Here is my life. Do whatever you want. It must result in that or such a study is meaningless. Once it results in that, we see the struggle and the fighting slowly decreasing and we becoming men of peace. You know, as a matter of fact, ever since we have been born and we have come from our mother's womb, we have always been fighting our way. We want this, we want that. Anyone comes to take our rights, we fight against it. We have been fighting and fighting and fighting. Struggling. Asserting ourselves. But when God comes on the scene and the regime of surrender comes in, slowly we begin leaving the fighting to Him. Let God fight for me. Instead, I trust Him. He fights for me. Like a good bridegroom would fight for his bride. My God is my bridegroom. That's why we call Jesus our bridegroom. That's why at every Mass we celebrate the wedding feast of the, of the groom, who is the Lamb who gave up his life for me. He is the bridegroom. He fights for me. It's no longer my worry, my stress. My bridegroom will always do what is best for me. So it changes the entire emphasis. And I start now trusting in him. The fighting becomes a thing of the past. And that is the time God opens my eyes to the solutions. The best example of this is Abraham. Abraham had no child for up to 100 years. And then the Lord blessed him with a child. And shortly after, the Lord said, I would like you to sacrifice your son, your only son. Abraham's reaction, please note, complete obedience. He said, Lord, I will do whatever you want. He brings his son up to the mountain and is about to sacrifice his only beloved son. And the Lord stops him. Kindly note the words of the Lord. Now I know that you truly obey and honor me. True honoring and obeying the Lord is given only by one proof. The things which are dear most and most precious to my life, I am ready to hand over to him. Kindly note, immediately after that, Abraham's eyes were opened and he saw a ram on the same mountain, which instead of his son he sacrificed. The ram was always there, but Abraham had a kind of blindness, he could not see it. In the same way, when we submit to God, that blindness is taken away and we suddenly see the solution, the way out to our problems. This is what must happen. Indeed, this is what happens each time whenever we surrender ourselves to God. That explains the sweet peace that we have. You will see the same attitude in Jesus Christ when He came. In Gethsemane, He was overcome with agony and turmoil, like any of us. Because you must remember, Jesus was God as well as man. So He felt what we feel. But look at His reaction. He asked His apostles to remain with Him. They fell asleep, but He continued in prayer in relying on God. And we find the angels came and strengthened him. He said to his father actually, a thing that we would say in our problems, Father, if it is possible, please take away this cup. 
He added the words, All things are possible for you, Father. You can do it. But he added a final word of trust. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. And that gave him the peace. Later, we are told when the soldiers came, John 18 says, they came to arrest him. Jesus just asked them, whom do you want? One word from Jesus and they all fell back. Jesus did not even push them. They all fell back. Such was the power because God was fighting for him. But his disciple Simon Peter, who had gone to sleep, did not have this advantage of relying on God's power. So, he had to rely on his own power. And so when he got up, the first thing he took was a sword and he attacked and cut off the ear of someone. This is what we do. When we don't rely on God's power, we have to rely on various swords in order to overcome the problems in our life. Such was the difference between Jesus and Simon Peter at that stage. Later, Simon Peter would become a man who in the power of God would go ahead. Such is our story too. We begin with people of our own swords. We end up as people with God's word, the power of the Bible. And that gives us an idea of how the Lord relates to us, how he works with us. We end up walking with him, neither behind like a donkey, nor ahead like a horse, but walking with him, in fellowship with him, in relationship with him. Now this brings us to a further fact. People who come to the word, who study it, why are they not all blessed? Jesus provides the answer. He says, whenever people come to the word of God, there are four kinds of people. All people who come to the word of God may be divided into four categories. The first, he said, are the kind who try to understand or hear the word of God, but it is lost on them because the devil does not allow them to concentrate. So such people you will see, they will come for retreats, programs. Constantly they'll be distracted. They'll look at the fan, they'll look at someone else, they'll look at their watch. The devil is not allowing them to concentrate. And Jesus said like this, he said, The word of God is like a seed, thrown. But just as the devil distracts them, in the same way it is as if a crow comes and lifts the seed and does not allow it to grow. So therefore such people will be burdened only by these distractions and they will not be able to have the seed, the word of God growing in their life. Jesus spoke of a second type of people who come to listen to the word of God. He said such people will be there who after hearing the word they will be happy, they will be glad. But after they go away, the trials of life will make them sad. They will say it does not work in my life. In other words, there will be people who are gladly listening to the word of God, but they are not willing to allow it to work in their lives simply because their roots are not deep. And Jesus compared it to the seeds which were thrown on the rocky ground, as a result of which the seed could not go deep into it. And he said, these people also lose their faith. And then Jesus spoke of a third category of people. He said, these people will listen to the word of God, but they are worries about getting rich and pleasures and enjoyment in life, they choke the seed. And he said it is almost as if the seed is thrown in thorn bushes. It comes up. It actually comes up. But it, its fruit never ripens because it is choked by the thorns. Such will be these people. They will grow in the word for a time. But their final fruit will never ripen because they are all the time worried about their future. They are worried about all other things, about riches, about their enjoyments, that they cannot settle and trust the Lord. And then Jesus said there will be a fourth. These will be blessed, he said, because the fourth type of people will listen and they will obey the word and the word will grow and bear fruit in their lives. He said that fourth category is like the seed which fell in good soil and it grows and gives fruit some 30, some 60, some 100. Therefore, take heed. Which kind of person are you? Which kind of person am I? As I come to the word of God, am I the person who goes for program after program, retreat after retreat, 
tries to read the Bible but I constantly get distracted. Are you the first kind whom the devil is not allowing to concentrate? Are you the second kind? You feel glad, you feel happy when you hear the word of God but later when trials come, you're completely punctured. Are you the second kind? Or perhaps you're the third kind. The kind who studies the word of God, who does work for the Lord, who grows, but your fruit doesn't ripen because at the back of your mind you're always worried. Will he help me to get the riches, the enjoyment I want? Your heart is choked and not allowed to bring forth the word of God. Are you indeed the person who is seeking God alone, who is like the good soil which absorbs the seed and grows for the Lord's glory? Such will see the face of God. They'll be able to experience and they'll be able to correct their lives and they'll be able to live out the words in Ephesians 5.17. Don't be fools, but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. Dear friends, these then are the threefold, I would say, stages in a God encounter. The first stage, godlessness. The second stage, believe in God, but only in outward things. The third, believe in God, Come to the word of God, which is important, but you become one of these three categories which finally do not make any headway. I may tell you that the first kind of people who are distracted, the seed which fell and the bird dropped it and took it away, are the people who are attacked by all kinds of bodily temptations. So attacked by bodily temptations, they come to the Lord But they cannot really surrender to the Lord because all those evil habits keep on dragging them. I may say to you the second kind of people, the people who are glad but they give in with trial, are the people who are emotionally charged by the word of God. They love music, they love praises, they love the fellowship of the Lord. But the reality of the struggle of the cross of the Lord is not wanted by them. The third kind, I would say, are those whose spirit is not won over by the Lord. Their spirit is still the old spirit, the spirit of getting successful in this world, of using Jesus for their purposes. And they just want Jesus as a means for that. And that is why, though for a time they survive, they are choked and they don't bear fruit for the Lord. Be the last kind. The kind who are obedient, the kind who grow, and the kind who feel the protection of the Lord as they walk hand in hand with Him.